If you would open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, the fifth chapter is where we'll begin here in just a moment. Luke chapter 5. It's good to see everyone with us today. We assemble together to worship our Heavenly Father. If you have any questions or comments about something you see or hear, don't hesitate to come up and, and talk to us. Give us a chance to answer your question and maybe start a Bible study. If that's something that you'd be interested in, we would love to be able to study with you from the wonderful Word of God. If an individual is going to take an approach to the Word of God that is going to work within their life, it must include trust. It must into, include trust. There's a lot of skepticism in the world today about the Bible. Depending on what you choose to watch or listen to, people will give you what they perceive to be is a hundred reasons why you shouldn't believe the Bible. But if you will spend time within the Word of God, you begin to see, you will begin to see reason after reason after reason to trust the Word of God. And when we develop a trust for the Word of God, we are also developing a trust for God Himself and a trust in Jesus and a trust in the Spirit that the Spirit would convey to us through the writings of the apostles and prophets the very Word of God. Imagine if you would, for just a moment, you are one of the disciples of Christ early on in His ministry. And he tells you to do something that all experience that day says will not work. But your reply to him is real simple. You say at your word. And this is what we see in Luke chapter 5. It's case in point of Peter and the other disciples who were there with them on the boat. Peter's the one we're going to focus on for a couple of minutes. But let's read in Luke chapter 5 beginning in verse number 1. So it was as the multitude pressed him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. And he continues there in the, the account of this. But what I find amazed, what I'm amazed at here is Peter's willingness. Although he said, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word. I will let down the net. We see even early on in the ministry of Christ, Peter's trust in the Lord. Yes, his trust will later waver. It'll waver at Jesus' trial when he will deny him three times. But ultimately, when you look at the life of Peter, you see a trust that is fed by the evidence of Jesus' authority, and Jesus' deity and this trust that is fed by the right source continues to grow and grow and grow. Which then results in a life of faithfulness to the Heavenly Father. There are three lessons that we can take away from Peter and his statement here to Jesus at your word. And here's the first one. Peter was willing to listen to Jesus. You know, it would appear that maybe he was trying to give an excuse. But Peter didn't say, Lord, I don't want to do that. I feel like it'll be a waste of time. No. He says, we tried it. It didn't work. But at your word, we will let down the net. He listened to what the Lord said to do. And we need to be willing to do the same thing. In all of our lives, if you're not yet a child of God, you need to be willing to listen to what the Bible says about Jesus. And about sin within your life and what he has done so that your sin could be forgiven. But as children of God, those who have obeyed the gospel, we must continue 
to listen to him. Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 24, he says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. And shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Notice again what he says. That he who hears my word and believes. And this is where Peter found himself. Listening to the words of Jesus and believing what Jesus told him to do. We also see in the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John, verse 31. Here in the midst of a context, we see the phrase... If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Many people profess to be disciples of Christ. They profess to be his students. They profess to, to abide by his word, but they do not. We have to make certain that we are abiding in his word. That we are listening to what his word has to say. And letting it control, let it guide, let it be the foundation for the life that we live. And everything that we say Everything that we do, we must let the word of Christ abide within us. Then we truly are his disciples. Even in Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, listen carefully there. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He says, if anyone hears my voice, and then notice the next phrase, and opens the door. We could go back to Jesus' discussion where he talks about his sheep will hear his voice voice and they they come unto him because they hear his voice well here it is the same idea if anyone hears my voice and opens the door he says i will come into him and dine with him but we have to be willing to listen and not just willing to listen we have to listen we have to listen to what jesus has to say to what his word has to say and then we have to trust it we have to have a complete trust Peter did. When the Lord told Peter what he needed to do, Peter said, at your word, we will cast our nets. And so they go out into the water and they did exactly what Jesus told them to do. Peter trusted in the Lord. And it was a complete trust. And we see it lasting throughout Peter's life. Ultimately, he trusted that if he would die for the cause of Christ, that he would spend eternity with God in heaven. Peter believed that. Just as the other apostles who faithfully served the Lord walk by that same trust, by that same understanding. And that's how we should be walking today. Sometimes a misunderstanding of what the Bible teaches regarding God and how God works becomes a stumbling block for many people who profess to believe in God. We kind of talked about this a little bit in our adult class out here. That just because we are Christians, just because we are children of God, doesn't mean that we are immune to the problems of living in this flesh. And the problems of this world. And the bad things that happen. Sometimes because we are children of God, and other times just because they happen. But sometimes if we don't spend enough time understanding, studying his word and understanding what it teaches about God. We could find ourselves in a situation where we see a bad thing happen in our life and just assume that God's not there. And just assume that God has broken the trust that we placed in him. But when we come to a better understanding... We can become like Peter and the apostles who died for the cause of Christ. They never viewed it as, well, you know, James, he was killed by Herod. I thought he was going to be protected by God and God didn't protect him. So it looks like God broke James's trust in him. No, they didn't draw that conclusion because they had a greater understanding of what it means to trust in the Lord, to put our trust in him, put our trust within his inspired word. You know, trust is a very important thing. And if you break someone's trust, it is not something that is easily repaired. And I'm sure you've seen that within your life or have known situations like that. Where someone you trusted, someone that you have just knew was always there, breaks your trust. And then the next day they come and they try to sell you a bill of goods and you're like, stay 10 feet back. There's no way I'm going to believe you right now. 
And sometimes it takes years to rebuild that. Well, we're human. You know, and people do bad things. Sometimes our trust is broken and we don't know if we can trust them again. God's not that. He's not that way. We can always trust him. He's proven himself time and time again in his word. And this is where studying the scriptures help us to see that. Now, the reason why I make that point is because you have to trust his word. In order to understand why you should trust the Lord, you need to trust what his word says. And Jesus made a promise to his disciples before he died, before he uh, died upon the cross and was buried in the tomb and then arose from the grave and ascended up into heaven. Before that happened, he made a promise to his disciples. And we're jumping in the middle of a conversation here between Jesus and his apostles. But look in John chapter 16, verse 12. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. They would. They would be able to later. But right now, he says, you cannot bear them now. John 16, verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. The apostles believed that. And the follow through was there on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So we believe it as well. We put our trust that the Lord did fulfill his promise to the apostles. And therefore the things that they taught were from God. Over in Ephesians chapter 3. Let's look at two passages here in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus there. We're going to start with Ephesians chapter 3. Let's start our reading there in verse 1. Let's start there. Let's read down through verse number 7. Follow along if you would. He says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. Paul says how by revelation God has made known to him the mystery. As I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. This mystery, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs in the same body, the partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. He continues there. The Ephesian brethren believed this. That Paul received it by revelation. That the other apostles and prophets received it by the Holy Spirit. That salvation was available to the Gentiles as well. They put their faith and their trust in the teachings of the apostles and the prophets. Believing, knowing that they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Back over to Ephesians chapter 2. One chapter over. Note with me there beginning in verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Trust that statement there. Trust the statement, the truth, that the household of God is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. We trust the word of God. Peter, in the early days of the ministry of Christ, as we said a while ago, knew to trust his word. We won't take the time to read it, but 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25, trust that the word of God endures forever. Now, if you will put, if I will put and keep my trust and you keep your trust in the word of God, then we will be able to walk in faithfulness before him because we will believe that which he has given to us and that he is able to forgive us of our sins, that his grace and his mercy are true and that by them we walk in fellowship with him because we trust in his promises. Over in 2 Peter chapter 1. Real quick verses 2 through 4. The apostle Peter here. Notice this follow, the following statement there. In 2 Peter 
chapter 1, beginning there in verse 2. He says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. As His divine power, you need to believe this, you need to put your trust here. As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We have a complete trust in God, in his word, in his promises. And this trust yields an unwavering obedience. Peter did what the Lord told him to do. He did say, we've already tried it. Fish ain't biting. We're not catching them. But it's your word. We will lower the nets down. An unwavering obedience to what the Lord tells us to do. And that's the way that we need to be living our lives. Now, I recognize, and you study the scriptures, you know this, we are going to be facing many trials and, and obstacles. We know that. As we mentioned a while ago, sometimes they may, become, they may come because of our faith in God and our, our taking a stand for the truth. But sometimes it may just be trials and obstacles that is indicative of the physical life that we live in. But we must always stay the course and not allow these trials and these obstacles to weaken us, but instead to make us stronger. You know, I think about how a child learns to walk. It's funny to watch a child learn how to walk. I know they fall down and that's really the funny part because we find it comical. But you think about how many times when a child, child that's never walked before, they're going through the early stages of crawling, they're getting their muscles figured out and everything, and finally you see them stand up there and they're wavering back and forth and they're trying to get things figured out. They fall a few times, but every step becomes more stable, every day more solid. The next thing you know, you're wishing they weren't walking because they're all over the place. But think about the process it takes to go from crawling to walking. And it is amazing the development within their brilliant minds that gets them to that point. They get back up and they keep going. Well, that's the way we need to be when it comes to trials and obstacles. We don't let them trip us up and we just stay down. We've got to learn from them. With every step, with every trial, with every obstacle, we should become stronger and more stable in our service unto God. James makes a very interesting point in James chapter 2, James chapter 1, that is, verses 2 through 4. Notice there in James 1. James writes, my brethren, count it all joy. James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be per perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So what an amazing idea here. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Because they're going to make your faith stronger. They're going to make your patience more endurable, if you would. And let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. But you have to go through the trials. And you have to go through them successfully. And what I mean by successfully is you don't let them hinder your service unto God. And there are a lot of trials. Sometimes we bring the trials on ourselves with bad decisions. But the question is, what do we do with that next step? When you fall down, what is the next step that you take? Do you get yourself back up, learn from your lesson? If we're talking about sin, ask God to forgive us and then walk on our way in service unto him. Or do we just give up and lay there? Peter didn't say, Lord, I'm not going to do this. We have failed today and nothing's going to make me think it's going to work any better now. No, we have to walk forward. We have to keep going. We must not allow these obstacles, these trials, the persecutions, tribulations, whatever you want to call it. We must not let them hinder 
our service unto God. Turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 5, real quick. Romans chapter 5, note with me there, verses 3 through 5. Romans 5, verse 3, Paul writes the following. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character produces hope. He says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of Christ has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So we also glory in tribulation because these tribulations make us stronger. They produce a perseverance that yields then a character. And a character then that yields forth a hope that does not disappoint. As children of God, we have every reason to stand strong. Even when we stumble and fall, we have every reason to stand back up and keep going. Not allowing anything to cause us to draw back from our obedience. The brethren that the, the, the writer of Hebrews, the ones he wrote this letter to, they were going to be facing trials. They probably already were facing some trials. And there, there's always that temptation that if we're facing trials, to want to step back from what's causing the trial. Okay, so another silly illustration, but you left a fork on the stove, the stove is hot. You reach forward, you pick up the hot fork. What do you do with it typically? When it's that hot, you let go of it. And sometimes people react this way when it comes to trials and tribulations that are a direct result of their faith in God. Sometimes the temptation is to let go, step back, and not do what they were doing before that brought on this persecution. That means they draw back from their obedience unto God. And so the Hebrew writer warns them. He urges them not to do this, not to shrink back, not to draw back. Hebrews chapter 10, let's start reading there in verse 35. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning there in verse 35. He says, therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which is great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, he says, my soul has no pleasure in him. We are not to allow ourselves to draw back. I think even in the 12th chapter, I believe it is, the Hebrew writer uses the term that we are not of those who draw back into perdition. When we see the obstacles, when we face the obstacles and the trials, we keep going. We push on through. We don't stop. We keep persevering so that we can establish character we can establish a hope that does not disappoint and this is in all areas of our lives probably the easiest place to live your life as a christian is for right where we're here right now because you're around everybody who's looking at you so anger is kept in control emotions everything like everything is just put on a happy face and i'm so glad to see you today but then monday comes around and you're at work or you're at school, or it's Thanksgiving and you're with your family. Not that we had a bad time with our family. But there are always those obstacles when you are real, you're, you're, you're taxed and, and, and your patience is maxed out. What do you do with those moments? So that's the point in every area of our life, whether we're talking about our individual lives, whether it be at work, school, home, family, wherever. Oh, let's talk about our family lives in that whole scope of things. Just because we're blood doesn't mean that I don't have a responsibility to treat you with love and care and compassion the way the Lord has treated me. In our work with the local church, we must make certain that we're always doing our part. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 would be a great passage to look at in regards to that, where every, do, every part does its share. But our obedience must always be unwavering. And if we allow, our, I say allow because that's what happens, if we allow ourselves to stumble and to fall, then we recognize what we've done and we repent and we turn back to God. When the Lord said to Peter, cast, let's go out there. I want you to cast your nets. Peter didn't say, what's the point? We're not going to catch anything anyway. Peter didn't say, you know, Lord, I can't do it right now. I'm tired. We've been on the boat all night. 
I'm ready to go home and take a nap. Go to bed. He didn't say that. He didn't say, Lord, I'm not a good fisherman. I can't throw the nets very well. That almost sounds like Moses a little bit. Moses said, Lord, I'm, I'm not a good speaker. Peter didn't say, well, I don't want to lower my net. Peter did exactly what the Lord told him to do. And from this display of faith and trust, we learn these lessons. We need to be willing to listen to the Lord. We need to be willing to trust his word. And we need to be willing to always have an unwavering obedience to what he has to say. Now, if you're not a Christian, you need to become a child of God. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you understand, you see that sin has separated you from God, then we're asking you this morning, what's causing the delay? Why have you not yet made the decision to repent of your sins and be buried with Christ through baptism? When you realize the truth, you need to act upon that truth. This is what happened on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, verse 38. 3,000 souls heard the truth. They believed the truth. They had trust in what was being said. And with an unwavering obedience, they did what they were told to do. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You need to do that today. If you are a Christian and you've not been serving the Lord faithfully, then it's time to come back to him this morning. Come back to his word, to him. Put your trust back in him within his word and reestablish the unwavering obedience in your life. If you're subject to the gospels, call an invitation. Come forward as we stand and as we sing.